All right, so welcome to the first episode of the Kino Metrics Podcast. That's still a working name right now, but we're going to figure out exactly where that needs to go when the time comes. Uh, I'm your host, Brian. We're here with our great founder, co-founder. Well, I'm not a co-founder, but he is, Patrick Bradley. Why don't you say hello to our devoted audience? Hi there. Thank you for having me, Brian. Yeah, of course. So this is kind of our first episode of our podcast that we're going to be talking a lot about. Um, just like a lot of patient safety, hospital, machine learning, AI, all that kind of good stuff that all has to do with the beautiful product that Ketometrics is putting out. This is not an advertisement. We legitimately, legitimately want to connect people with good, high quality content, talking to people who know what they're talking about within these fields, just so you, all of y'all can stay educated, hopefully a little bit entertained, and we can all have a good time in this process. So first of all, Patrick, why don't you give us a little bit of background about what Ketometrics is and what the product does? Sure. So Kinemetrics, we are developing a uh, precision patient safety platform. And what that means is that we want to empower uh, bedside clinicians, primarily nurses at this time, to be able to better uh, prevent harm for their patients. Um, healthcare acquired conditions are, are remain a, a significant challenge uh, for hospitals and for clinicians and for the patients that have to suffer them. Um, we started by tackling the, the the most common healthcare acquired condition, which is patient falls. Uh, there's still about a million patient falls every year in U.S. hospitals. Uh, it, you know, recent literature has shown that our our original estimations that come from about 2015 on what the cost of that is. That estimation was around 66.94 in 2015 dollars. That was a gross underestimation. There's a, a article that came out just a few months ago in in one of the JAMA journals. Uh, that showed that the direct cost um, for a patient fall is 36000 a little over $36,000, regardless of, of injury level. Uh, so you have really, a, you know, a great burden on our healthcare system that is really directly felt by patients and by clinicians. Um, and so what we strive to do with Kinemetrics is lessen the burden of caring for patients on the clinicians themselves while giving them the tools that they need uh, to, to better provide better care. So we focus on clinical decision support. And we started by uh, really you know, transforming the way that we do risk assessments for patient falls. Uh, and by doing that, we are using the assessment and the documentation and the data that's already existing in electronic health record uh, currently and putting that to use. So a nurse takes the time to do a full head to toe assessment of their patient to really, you know, um, take the, put their clinical skills to work, put their license to work. And they document that in current state, they document that. And then they have to go and fill out a separate fall risk assessment, which is seven to 10 questions. They're pretty subjective and they don't really dive into, you know, the whys behind fall risk. It's, it's you know evidence based, but have they haven't been updated largely in over fifteen years? Most of these tools, and so we instead of doing that, use machine learning and using this growing field of of artificial intelligence um, to take all that data that exists, that all that data that's supposed to be putting being put to use in the in the record, to better assess the and more accurately assess that patient's individual risk, and in addition to then giving the clinician, you know, are, is that patient low risk, moderate risk, or high risk, which is, you know, there's value in that in itself. Uh, very importantly, we provide the, you know, what is driving whatever the risk is. So if the patient is a high risk, what are the key factors behind that? And when we provide that, then that allows that clinician to, if they know the specific things that are driving that, direct the most appropriate interventions to that patient. All right. So basically what I'm getting from here is that we're taking the modern day approach. So bringing in the buzzword of the day, AI, machine learning, we're trying to apply it to something that's obviously been an issue throughout through like the existence of hospitals and healthcare. So could you kind of explain like in like layman's terms, like how exactly you, uh, Kinemetrics is machine learning, AI, 
solution would differ from just what's been going on for the last however many years? Sure. Uh, so like I mentioned, falls is not a new problem. Patients have been falling in the hospital for since hospitals existed. Uh, we like to, you know, harken back to Florence Nightingale's quote that was published in her book in 1859, uh, that the first requirement of hospitals that should do patients no harm. And we haven't gotten very far since then in the 165 years or whatever it is now. Um, that's still a challenge. And patient falls is still the most common uh, healthcare acquired condition. And it leads to you know a third of patients who fall in the hospital actually requ uh, acquire an injury. And it's attributed to 11,000 excess deaths a year. Falling is, you know, really can be the start of a, of a clinical deterioration in patients and, you know, cascading effects from that. And so there's four steps that if you look at the, you know, literature out there and the evidence out there and the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality provides, you know, four key steps to prevent falls and, and to improve, you know, your falls prevention program as a healthcare system. Number one is to implement you know, universal fall precautions. That's typically what people think about when they think about this. They think about the, you know, the yellow non-slip socks that are notorious in hospitals that all patients wear. And, um, you know, having your floors clear of any clutter and not having lines and cords for people to trip on and not having, you know, wet surfaces, things like that. Those are the universal precautions just to keep a safe environment, okay? Number two in that step is to then assess the individual's risk factors. And that's really where kinematics focuses, but I'm going to move on to the next step, which is based on those risk factors, then implement a care plan and interventions, you know, specific to those patients' risks. Number four, of course, is if there is a harm event, if there is a fall, conduct post-fall procedures uh, to learn about that, whether it be acute uh, parent cause analysis, root cause analysis, or some other event review, so you can learn and do better next time. Now, why we chose to focus on the, that step two, that second step, I think I mentioned, is currently when we say, you know, provide a risk assessment for our patients, that's a very, it's a manual process. Uh, there's two very common tools out there. Uh, Morse fall scales actually was originally published in 1985 and the Johns Hopkins fall risk assessment tool. They're not the only ones, but those are the, generally the most common. The Johns Hopkins tool uh, is a little newer as I think first published in 2005. There are seven to 10 questions between them. Uh, manually, in addition, the nurse answers those. The general accepted uh, clinical protocol is at least once a, sh a nurse's shift and with any clinical changes that would impact the score. Now, the, the challenge we see, especially in today's healthcare environment is nurses are tasked with so many things. And whenever there's a new initiative, somehow part of it typically falls on, on a nurse. Uh, that extra assessment for falls risk, while it might be small, it's not the greatest focus because it's pretty well acknowledged that it's not gonna give you the best information. It's they're pretty generic. They kind of cast a wide net in order to not miss anyone. So uh, from a statistical standpoint, they're typically highly sensitive, but lack some specificity. And because of that, you know, it's, it's not really providing that value. And so the trickle down effect of that is while we're supposed to provide interventions based on the specific uh, factors in that patient's risk assessment, when you lack a specific risk assessment, it becomes very difficult to do that. So hospitals and, and clinicians have, you know, a list or a bundle, if you will, of interventions. And they oftentimes do exactly that. And they just bundle them together and say, look, you know, we're just going to throw everything out there. And if we put a bundle, it's very common in healthcare that we do bundles with good reason that will stop patients from falling. And, and it does work, but it's very, very resource intensive. And we are getting more and more into these interventions that use more and more resources. So with the advent of AI, it's not just what we're doing here at Kinemetrics using AI in a very unique way of doing the risk assessment. There's AI being put forth for you know, the intervention side. So we have a lot of growing use of um, telehealth platforms for this type of thing, using virtual monitoring and virtual sitting uh, where you place a camera in a patient's room to avoid having to push someone at the bedside 
and physically watch the patient one on one. Now we can allow people to sit in a remote uh, area and watch more than one patient. But again, there's a lot of resources involved in that. Not only the resources to actually have the cameras, but to have the people that are watching them. And if you don't have that specific risk assessment that is really telling you who's at risk and why they're at risk, it's a challenge then to actually appropriately direct those resources. And that's what we're doing differently at Kinemetrics is using machine learning to provide a more accurate risk assessment with the idea that if we can tell you the why behind it and more accurately who truly is at risk, then you can actually reduce the expenditure of your resources by and better apply them at the same time and get better outcomes because of it. Gotcha. So it's kind of just all about making it as efficient as possible, making sure those resources in the hospital, which are definitely not indefinite, they're definitely not infinite, to make sure that it all goes to the right people. So could you kind of paint, paint a picture for me? So like, let's imagine, like hypothetically, there's two separate timelines, like parallel dimensions or something, where you got 10 patients, right? Let's say um, in a pre-kinemetrics world and in a world with kinemetrics, like kind of how would like the entire staff like take the information from them and distribute resources towards them? Like how would that look differently in this kind of 10 person sample size for each? Sure. That's a good question. And 10 is a small number. Um, and let's say that's, that's, let's say a 10 you, nursing, 10 person nursing, unit, which is a, a small nursing unit, but it's not uncommon, especially with specific patient populations that you would walk on a nursing unit that was 10 plus rooms. And every one of those units, every one of those rooms, excuse me, has a high fall risk sign on it. And so that's current state is that if you're in a, in a, you have 10 patients and there's some you know, they're somewhat homogenous in their, you know, disease processes. Maybe it's an orthopedic surgery unit or a oncology unit, or uh, the list goes on of, you know, what a quote unquote is a high risk population. There's a good chance that one of these current tools that we're using would just label everyone on the unit, a high risk patient. And then the problem is, so if everyone's a high risk, then is really anyone a high risk? Because one of the, you know, common, you know, effective, interventions is to move the highest risk patient close to the nurse's station. Well, you can't do that if everyone on the unit is the highest risk. So you have 10 patients all vying for the same resources. Okay. If I'm on a nursing unit and I'm a leader of, you know, a 10 bed unit and I do have access to virtual monitoring or virtual sitting, the reality is my hospital can probably cover five to 10% of my bed of the beds in the hospital. So again, I'm vying for these resources and there's nothing distinguishing really using the tools that are currently available, you know, who needs it the most or the why behind it. So we end up kind of piecemealing the best we can, you know, the resources there. Well, this patient can get moved to that unit, that's a, to this bed because it's available right now. We can possibly give a, you know, camera and a virtual monitor to this patient. This one can have the uh, low profile bed and the list goes on. Now you take kinemetrics and put that in there and right off the bat, we can be pretty confident that we'll have 20% less patients identified as high risk off the bat. So that right there. And then most importantly though, is it's not static. We update in real time as new information comes into the, into the electronic health record. And so it's not even that the patient's high risk, low risk, moderate risk, it's what's going on at that time. If, you know, what's driving their risk is a high risk, is a medication that makes them, you know, more prone to falling, that will change when that patient has received that medication versus when they're, you know, eight, 10 hours removed, depending on what type of medication it is. And that allows the resources then to really be driven to where they're most effective. So if instead of just saying, okay, well, now I have 10 patients, so maybe we've brought it down to eight patients are high risk. And let's say we're talking about a high risk population. It's only eight patients are deemed high risk. But even within those eight patients, we risk stratify within that as to what's driving it, who's more at risk, who's less at risk. So one, their fat biggest factor might be a mentation issue or level of consciousness or something like that. Well, that patient actually will probably be a better candidate for a virtual monitoring platform or for a camera watching them. While the patient that's, you know, next door, what's really driving their biggest risk factor is the medications they're on that I, I mentioned before. 
Well, those are different interventions. You don't necessarily need to put them on a on virtual monitoring camera. They're going to be better served by um, having a toileting schedule and the frequent rounding, or maybe having a commode at their bedside or a chair available to them, or if they use assistive devices, something like that. So we prompt with, you know, providing that clinical, clinical decision support within that even a high risk population, what is the most appropriate intervention for that individual? So in this case, does, is, does, the, um, does the AI just tell you what to do or is there still kind of like a human um, decision aspect to it? Yeah, it's important to, to know when I say clinical decision support, that is a, an FDA term. Uh, so we do not make the decision for any clinician. We do not force function anything. We provide the, the clinician with the information needed and the why behind it. And that's a, a key factor of clinical decision support uh, is that we, it's not a black box. It's not just going to do something automatically. It tells you the why behind it. So if it says your patient's high risk for falling, it's going to tell you the top reasons why they're at high risk for falling. And yes, recommend something that has been kind of agreed upon with the the hospital system again not forcing that that's you know we work with our customers and our health systems to you know go with the list of interventions they have available to them but at the end of the day it's still the clinician's decision they still are the licensed practitioner um, and we trust their judgment there's always going to be see things that they can see in real time and so there is no force functioning it's not something that they they can't see behind the curtain they can absolutely see you know the why behind the recommendations that are coming to them. Right. I think that like one of the biggest things that I would think about when it comes to AI and just how it is starting to insert itself into different aspects of our, you know, everyone's everyday lives is kind of considering like, does that take away from the human aspect of it? Because I think we've all seen versions of black mirror or something where so some dystopian future where some kind of, AI old the Lord is forcing everyone to do something or act a certain way or changing the way complete things we look at things. So from I imagine from like a medical perspective, since like medical care is like some of the most human possible um, human possible like relationship that you can possibly have between a patient and a doctor, patient, nurse, et cetera, et cetera, throughout like our entire like human existence. Like, has there been any pushback from the medical community about adopting more AI tools? I can't, I, I can't really speak for the medical community at large, but I, I, I think there is an, an understanding and an acceptance that AI is coming. It's here in many ways. It, it's, I mean, it's in the common zeitgeist of our, of our culture at this point. Um, it's going to impact healthcare if it hasn't already. I, you know, I share this with my fellow nursing colleagues that, you know, I, I really want nurses at the table because uh, this, these things are going to happen and we need to be involved in the decision-making process behind how AI impacts clinical care or it's going to be decided for us in some way. And so, you know, I think this is definitely an area of healthcare that's not going away and i'm very hopeful i'm very much an ai optimist and i have no formal education in ai I didn't I, I'm, an, I'm a nurse uh I, I went to nursing school they don't teach ai uh, they don't teach computer programming uh i just i found my way into this and that's a you know a topic for maybe another day uh but the important thing to know is that i truly believe that clinicians and nurses especially go into this world and into this career field with a purpose they they go to, to make a difference they go to be you know help their patients and care for people they don't go to be administrators in the sense that they're not there i've never found a nurse that likes documenting they we understand why we document but we don't love it uh so at the so and we, we, you know, we go into it to, to be clinicians. Like we are licensed professionals who are licensed to assess a, a patients, make care plans, uh, administer high risk medications, oftentimes, and really do the bulk of the work that's actually done inside of a hospital setting. And I do believe that AI and machine learning is offers us a chance to really hone in on that and get back to that and start to 
take away the extra stuff that we as nurses and clinicians spend our time doing that's not value added. It's not bringing value to our patients or to our own workday. Um, kinemetrics is just one example, and I know it's a small win in that you no longer have to do a extra nursing assessment for falls. We, But at the same time, the other big win is there's a lot that goes into a nursing assessment, and there's not a lot that comes out of it. Believe it or not, we as nurses spend a lot of time filling in a lot of flow sheet rows, sometimes writing notes, and they're not often even seen by the care team. And this is a way that is bringing value to that. It's taking the information that the expert clinician put in there in the chart and doing something with it and giving them back value. Uh, and I think that's just a kind of a, a first step in the transformation of what AI can do for healthcare and for our, 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 you know, healthcare workforce that is increasingly stressed and burnt out is giving them back the value in what they're doing, showing them that there is value in, you know, documenting a really good assessment because they're going to get something back from it. There's machine learning or AI will be there to help them use that. It's never going to replace them. I think we are so far away from that, you know, Skynet on the bad end and like the helpful robot that does your job for you on the good end, we are ways away from both of those things in the healthcare world. Um, healthcare generally adopts technology a little, a lot. I was gonna say a little, but probably a lot slower than, you know, consumer areas and things like that. Um, but even if we weren't that slow, we'd still be a ways away. And so anytime one of my nurse colleagues asked me if AI is gonna replace them, I just kind of chuckle. Not in my lifetime, certainly, I don't believe. Um, but again. Yeah, for sure. I think that I and many people out there have put a lot of thought into just how AI is going to change our lives, both in terms of like productivity and like everyday life and like how it's going like, to insert itself into all the different like institutions that we interact with like on a daily basis or when we just need to at certain times. And just seeing it start to happen in the, the medical world, like I feel like that's a good first step uh, because I, as far as I know, I mean, you can educate me more on this. Like, have there been other big like breakthroughs within the medical world in AI? Like, are there any notable ones that are being used right now? I think th there are. Um, there are a lot of really cool things behind the scenes. I think one of the biggest uh, applications that our people are pushing for with AI is on image interpretation uh, that I've seen. Like, and you can teach a machine off of millions of radiographs or x-rays or echocardiograms or MRIs versus, you know, a clinician or, a, you know, a highly skilled physician, for example, that reads echoes every day still wouldn't see maybe millions in their career. So there's a lot of opportunity there, not again to replace anyone, but to help augment their workflow and alert them to, you know, um, pathological processes, new diseases, things like that. Everything from, you know, identifying melanoma, which there's a there's those cautionary tale in there as well that I'm, I'm aware of, to you know detecting uh, tumors in, in in MRIs and CTs and. I think that's definitely something that there's already work being done on that and there's a lot of great work and then another you know application again back to kind of the point of reducing the the you know the extra work the non-value added work from the clinicians is any application into reducing documentation load whether that be um ai in combination with you know a transcription service to accurately transcribe conversations and interpret those into uh, clinical notes that is, you know, companies out there working on that. And I think that has wonderful applications. I think everyone would be excited to be able to have just their notes written for them. Um, so uh, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of things expanding in the field. And then of course you have more of the administrative use of, of AI, less clinical, but in that realm of, you know, streamlining, um, coding and billing and things like that, uh, which I believe because they're less, you know, they don't have an, a direct clinical impact, things tend to move a little faster in that realm. 
Uh, but I'm hopeful that we start to see more and more of the clinical applications in a good way um, come about. All right, great, great. Uh, I don't want to stray stray too far away from our original topic, which is just introducing kinemetrics. So I think I'll just leave us with one last question here. So kind of as we look towards the future, uh, what are some potential developments or improvements that you envision for kinemetrics and its patient safety pro, uh, platform? Sure. So we, we started with uh, patient falls because it's you know the most prevalent uh, hospital acquired condition there is. Um, but it's not where we're, we're stopping. I mean, for the first one, I, I believe we will continue to improve our algorithm, our model, and provide better and better clinical decision support for our, for our clinicians. Um, but the future roadmap for us is, is kind of step in a stepwise approach, tackling those other health care required conditions with the same kind of mindset of giving the, the support to back to the clinician and empowering them to do something about it. So our next uh, one that we're working on currently is uh, pressure injuries. So a, a devastating hospital acquired condition if a patient was to you know, develop a, a severe pressure injury, um, which is you know sometimes seen as a bed sore is kind of a common term for that. Uh, and again, very similar workflow to falls in that there is a manual extra assessment done specific to uh, pressure injury risk it, that, you know, it's been validated, it's iterator reliability is very good, uh, but is it specific enough uh, to really give the, nur the, the nurse and the doctor and, you know, the nursing assistant the information they need? And there are not enough wound care nurses to go around um, they are a valuable, valuable resource and expert in, in the hospital setting. So anything we can do to better direct the resources that are needed to best prevent the range of, of pressure injuries that are out there. So I think that, that hospital required pressure injury is commonly called puppies, um, which are not at all happy, um, are, you know, that's kind of an umbrella term. There are lots of categories within that it could be a device related pressure related shear injury moisture related and so we are really working to dive into that and give them more specific details so they can better prevent that with the same mindset that we're taking towards falls which is give you the why behind what's putting the patient at risk and prompt based on that why the most the best evidence-based approach there is to prevent it Okay, great. Super exciting stuff. I'm glad. Um, I feel like you gave us such a great in-depth description about everything that Kinemetrics is about. I feel like it's something we can all get behind, just making everyone's lives easier, preventing all these falls, preventing all these hospital-related um, accidents. So thank you for everything that you've done. We're going to continue on in the next time. Next time you see Patrick, I think he already kind of talked a little bit about his background as a nurse. We're going to dive into that and how that ended up transitioning from him into a tech founder bro. So look forward to that. I'm sure that he's going to enjoy embracing that, that stereotype and wearing a Patagonia and all that. So anything else you want to say, Patrick, to the people before we sign <laughs> off? I uh, do not have a Patagonia vest on order. Don't worry. Uh, no, I, I, I'm looking forward to this. I hope this is the first of many conversations that you get to have, not with just myself and the Kinemetrics team, but um, other experts in, in patient safety and you know AI uh, impl uh, applications to medicine and healthcare. I do not pretend to be the expert in any of these things. So I look forward to really having other experts in the field you know, come and join us. Yeah, definitely. I'm looking forward to be educated and to educate, hopefully, people around the world, too. So that's the whole point of this this podcast. All right. So thank you for listening. If you ever listen, this is the first episode of many, hopefully, of the Kinemetrics, still maybe unnamed podcast that we'll figure out when the time comes. Um, that's all. That'll be in the title. So uh, you can find us on YouTube. I'm, I'm going to get us on Spotify podcasts and all that kind of stuff. If you want to listen without the video so you don't have to stare at our faces. Um Signing off. Talk to you next time. Thanks, Brian.